I have with me my good friend Bob Nielsen again this week. This is part two of the show of the Bob. Yep. And before we get going, Bob, we're going to review. Bob did a 15-minute show, but he has stories that could go for 15 years. But before we get to Bob, we want to remind all the veterans and all the public out there, every Monday at Dunkin' Donuts in Centerville, we have a veterans group. Bob's a member of it. We have anywhere from five to 15 veterans showing up, and we just talk. There's no agenda. Nothing special. It's just veterans with veterans. No dues. No dues, no <laughs> membership, no rank, no religion, no politics. It's just coffee and laughter, right? Yep. And Bob, Walter Pauls, who many of you know from Queen Anne's County High School, he and Bob have become friends just talking over their experiences. We also have a book club. We have a glee club. We're trying to get a chess club going. This Monday, which will be after the show's on, we're even taking a boat trip. But if you're a veteran, you'd like to get involved, give us a call. Now, let's go back to Bob. Bob, on our first show, and thank you for coming back again, most people after I interview them usually leave the country or go to an alias or witness protection program. In the first show, we learned that uh, you're from Long Island. From Long Island. Played football. Played football at RPI, the worst college football team. Worst team in the history, team. like my Washington Commanders. In the that history of the United States football. <laughs> okay. Then you went in the Marines. Went in the Marine Corps. Now got commissioned. Okay, so you became an officer. Right. Now, we kind of stopped because we talked about a million different things about your Vietnam experiences. How about share with people, if you will, you were a Marine on the ground in combat. Tell us, most of us know nothing about it. Well, let me tell you how I got into doing this. Go ahead. Was 1965, uh, I was on a med cruise in the uh, Mediterranean with a battalion of Marines, and there is nothing better in the world than being a battalion oh. of Marines on a med cruise pulling it's sunshine. Have a good Liberty time. ports. Oh. Where were some uh, of the ports you pulled into? Break my heart here. Oh, Naples. Uh, let's see. We uh, went to. Naples, we went to Corsica, we went to Sardinia. A lot of sun and uh, a lot of wonderful fabulous. sights. Fabulous. Oh. It, it was unbelievable. And anyway, uh, 1965, and the news comes out that we were putting a battalion of Marines in Vietnam. 1965, so we got right. a year straight, okay. So we thought our battalion in the Mediterranean was going to go through the Suez Canal and go right on around and land in Vietnam. Oh, right to Vietnam, okay. Uh, as it turned out, they kept us in the Mediterranean for an extra month, and we returned to the United States. So I'd been in the Marine Corps about seven years then, four in college and three active duty, and uh, it was almost my time to get out of the Marine Corps. And I said, well, I can't miss this incredible opportunity sure. to see what combat see is what like. See what it's about. Uh, so I talked to the Marine Corps and said, I'll stay an extra year if you send me to Vietnam. You volunteered for Vietnam. And they reeled me in like a great big fish. Well, I want to shake your hand again. <laughs> I did the same thing. In the Army, we called it a 1049. I remember going to the drill sergeant and said, I want to go to Vietnam. I want a 1049. He looked at me and said, most people are trying to avoid it, you dummy. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. So in the spring of 66, uh, uh, I went down, got out of Camp Lejeune, and I went to Camp Pendleton, and uh, we got on a ship with about 1,500 Marines and about 3,000 soldiers sailing out of San Diego. Uh, now, this gave, is during LBJ's big, big buildup, right? This is this, this the oh, beginning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we're all naive, all peacetime Marines. Oh, I yeah. can't, I don't believe there was a combat vet on the ship. Mm. Uh, we pulled in the Naha, Okinawa, and everybody went to Liberty and got drunk. <laughs> I was uh, the brig officer on the ship, and we had a grand time, and the brig was filled up in about 30 minutes. <laughs> and uh, we pulled into uh, initially Saigon, and then went up to uh, to um, we pulled into Saigon. We came up to Cameron Bay and went to Da Nang. Got off in Da Nang and uh, was told I was going to be transferred down to Chu Lai. We're waiting in Da Nang at the airstrip, and there's about 
probably 40 body bags from a big battle that was so going that, on. You actually seen the on body the side bag. of the mm. uh, airstrip. Outside of the airstrip, and the smell is the smell mm, you will never mm, forget mm, the rest mm, of your mm, life. Mm. I get down to Chulai and find out that a good friend of mine, Billy Edwards, that I played football with in college, the next day was his last day. I was effectively replacing You're coming in the country and he's leaving, okay. So we immediately went to a Little Hooch and had some beers, <laughs> and he said to me in so many words, Bob, this is the most screwed up disaster. Oh, no. uh, I won't use the profanity he used. We get the point, though, yeah. <laughs> but he says, you're not going to believe it. And the next morning, uh, Colonel called me in and said, you're going to be B Company, Company Commander. And he said, uh, go get your first sergeant. Uh, C Company, Charlie Company, is operating outside just north of Vietnam, with the, uh, north of July with the 5th Marines, go up and see them. So you're gonna, they're going to send you right up there to see yeah. what, what's going on. So the next day I get the first sergeant and I get a sergeant and we load up a PC and we drive up to... PC uh, personnel carrier. To Kai, yeah. yeah. Um, drive up to Tam Key. Um, unbeknownst to me and the first sergeant, uh, part of that territory went through... a. Enemy territory. <laughs> Welcome to and Vietnam. And all of a sudden, we don't see any more Marines, and then we don't see any more Arvon, the Army soldier. And then all we see are civilians, and pretty soon they stop waving. And when we get to July, a couple hours later, I guess we'd driven 40 miles, they look at us and said, where the hell did you come from? This road's closed. How did you get through? <laughs> yeah, you weren't, you weren't so, supposed to make it. <laughs> I'm realizing real quickly that Vietnam is a little different than what I this thought. This is not a resort. So the unit I was with was a combat engineer unit. They basically set up amphibious landings, but in Vietnam we did it for helicopter landings. So I would have my troops from B Company First Shore Party dispersed with an infantry battalion, and we all had red patches on our pants and on our helmets. Now, why did you have, yeah. Uh, so we'd be noticed who oh, we it, were. who you were. Because we essentially took wounded and dead from where they were shot and injured. The corpsmen patched them up. Hmm. We took them, collected them, took them to a helicopter landing zone, got them on got board, them and got them out of there, hmm. and then brought in, essentially uh, brought in ammunition and food supplies okay. when we could. So I uh, am in this little base up in Chulai, in, in Tanke, and I fly out into these landing zones, and they're filling up the helicopter with dead and wounded, Body and, bags and wounded. Viet Cong dead and prisoners. And I'm looking at this, and the Marines loading these wounded and dead on the plane, their eyes are about the oh, size of the, this. The sights you can't explain, Like you right? see in Life magazine. Yes. And I'm realizing this is not quite like what I saw no. in Victory at Sea. <laughs> the first night I finally, this is again at um, Tam Key, I uh, tried to get some sleep that night. We were attacked, and I jumped in a foxhole. And the next morning I get up and I crawl out of the uh, tent, and a mortar had landed hmm. not from here to that camera, Five feet away from where could have been I was. Killed. Yeah, you could have been killed. And the mortar didn't go off. Oh, it didn't go off. It's actually I, stuck I, in the ground. Still got a picture of this at home somewhere. So I'm rapidly realizing a lot of what happens is... This is luck. not Hollywood, right? This is not right. Hollywood. So I'm still observing. I'm learning. And I went w out with the troops and I w would go on patrol and we went into villages and... Uh, if you did you have went, a let me see, did you have a base camp you're working at? keep well, coming yeah back. we're working okay. out of a base camp okay. and the infantry knew the areas of operating now okay. we were mainly fighting Viet Cong okay. these were not 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 North not Vietnamese regular North Vietnamese yeah. they were all wearing black pajamas and it was mainly agricultural land with a lot of rice paddies okay there were hills around but we weren't in the mountains and uh, we would our infantry guys would spot Viet Cong from time to time. I remember one time they spotted almost a platoon of Viet Cong. We wanted to get permission to hit them with B-52s, 
and were basically told that, that you're going to go back to the White House to get permission to do that. So it's good the chain of command that to get have permission. That would 24 hours. Meanwhile, and, they're gone or they've hit the Viet you. Cong would have been in Laos by the time we got approval. Now, let me just ask a question. The Viet Cong, now, so everyone gets clear, North Vietnamese regulars were actually a military unit, right? Right. From North Viet. The Viet Cong were village people or what? Village people, citizens, men okay. and women. Oh, men and women. Some of the toughest prisoners we got were women. Were Viet Cong women, uh, 21 years old, extremely good looking, wearing the black pajamas the same as the males, uh, wearing the conical straw hats. And if they were out farming, you wouldn't know the difference exactly. whether they were farming or getting ready to ambush you. So during day, like you said, they might be working on a farm. At yeah. night or some other point, they might pick They're up trying a... trying to kill you. Trying to kill you, okay. And they're planting mines and bungee stakes and things like this. Bungee stakes is essentially a bamboo stake that, with they, urinated on that it. they put yeah. in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll cause infections. So I did this for a couple of three days seeing what was really going on. Now you're just observing at this point, is that I'm correct? I'm observing. observing, okay. But I needed credibility when I took over sure. the company. Yeah. And so when I took over B Company, first shore party, I had guys out on operations. I had one corporal that had been on 24 battalion size operations mm. of a week or two weeks. Now explain to everybody, battalion, how many people are we talking? Battalions uh, should be a thousand. So infantry. a thousand men involved in a, a in military a, in operation. In a big battle for a week or two. This is a major event. And I'm, my guys are basically dealing with the medevacs and the right. KIA. Right. Uh, it was pretty incredible stuff and pretty intense. And you'd fly in these landing zones and a lot of the landing zones would be hot. And that so, means people were shooting back and well, forth, right? Yeah. Bullet holes are coming through the helicopter. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure they know what, not hot temperature. We're talking <laughs> yeah, about no. guns, <laughs> ammunition. <coughs> so you're getting bullet holes through the helicopter, and my eyes are getting bigger and bigger. And uh, more than a couple of times, I got off the helicopter when we dropped off the wounded and got down and kissed the ground. Just, uh, uh, I learned pretty quickly that the... Infantry had their ways of patrolling and knowing what the operations were. Um, now, did you work with the Army, or this is all Marines? Uh, all Marines. All Marines, okay. Uh, Marines had I Corps at that time. Okay. okay. About a year later, we were replaced by the Army as they moved north and took over the same area. Um, and it was halfway between Chilai and Da Nang, and about 30 miles inland from the so we're uh, talking hot South China Sea. and humid oh. and swampy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it hot, it, humid, the, right, swampy. most of the pictures of Vietnam come out like that, right? Yeah. Uh, just, I don't want to use the word, but it was hell on earth, basically, right? Yeah, and, and the smells were incredible, oh. and the smells of bodies, bodies were is terrible. just unbelievable. You never get over that, do you? So when we weren't doing this, when the operation was over after a week or two, my guys would come back to the rear area at Chulai, which was relatively secure. Safe, we okay. get attacked with mortars and stuff once in a while. And we go back to our regular jobs, which were was really mine sweeping Highway 1, segments okay. of Highway Keeping Highway, one. and that was a major that artery. That was the main okay. north-south highway right. that went all the way from Saigon uh, to Hanoi. To Hanoi, all the, the whole length of Vietnam. Was mostly a gravel dirt road. Okay. Uh, wasn't paved at that time. Now, did we use it and the North Vietnamese? And Everybody Vietnam? used it. Everybody, okay. Everybody <laughs> used it. Uh, but I remember we had an issue where our colonel decided that we would, or offered to the division headquarters, we'd have the stretch of highway, one that we were responsible for, mine swept before sunrise. Mm, so you went in the dark. And me and the other company commander met with him and basically told him uh, no in a not unfriendly <laughs> sentence and not friendly sentence no no way you can't do this we I mean, hungered down we're when the sun went down you know 60 year old mine detectors yeah and a bayonet knife no so no not in the dark um, shortly after my unit uh, did this mine sweeping for about a week or 10 days this time it was south of July 
I was re trolley company replaced us, and they were doing the same stretch of road we did, and they weren't there two days when um, they were going across a section of highway, and a 500-pound bomb was set mm -hmm. off in a culvert, mm. and I think we lost six or seven mm. guys, mm. Um, and it was command de detonated, so it was a U.S. bomb that had been rigged in the yeah, to culvert. To a bomb, to a bomb. And controlled by somebody with a little electronic device to set it off. That's when we were doing our peaceful job. So that was <laughs> crazy. Um, the uh, infantry, the grunts, were unbelievable. And those okay. poor sons of guns. Really, and grunts, really, the army, we called them 11 bravos. These are the guys yeah. with guns. No with guns in the infantry. Fighting the war. Fighting the war. And even when they're big battles were over, they returned, they were still on the perimeter. Sure. They're still doing the patrolling and the guarding, and I have the absolute most respect for anybody that was in the infantry, because what they did day in and day out would scare the It was war out. for 365 days. I mean, there weren't PX you could see it on their faces. faces. Yes. And what I did, because I was in the kinds of units like combat engineers that were attached, uh, we at least got a little bit less Better. pressure when okay. we were pulled back to a rear air. It was scary stuff. Oh, Bob, and, let me just we'll go continue. Ahead. But you and I talk about this in a book club. The whole group yeah. talks about it. Hollywood gives us such a false impression of war and what your grunts exactly. do. Exactly. Right? Totally wrong. I, 95, 98% of the films that come out of Hollywood are BS. Yeah. I wouldn't waste any time Good. on them. I mean, you talked about the smells. Not, I mean, I, you can't describe seeing somebody with their, all their internal yeah. organs outside. And you can't describe to somebody that's not been to combat. No, no. And you can't describe the heroic things that these troops did every day just as part of their normal job. You know, I, I was, when I was in the Army, I flew an LMD, which is a large metal desk. Yeah. The real warriors didn't shave, didn't no. shower. They used to call what we call GI showers, take men and stuff and put deodorant on. Uh, yeah, you smoked cigarettes in the rain. You lived in the mud. I mean, these are, these are warriors. And when they got a warm beer, it was glorious. Oh, yeah. It was and the they, greatest thing a in the hot, world. Uh, we'll get you hot meals every day. Yeah, I bet <laughs> those sea rations warm them up. You, we can't give enough respect for them. Oh, it's a for what they did and everything else. I mean, most veterans, I'm speaking for myself now, I don't care what the war is, we respect the warriors, right? Because they go through things that Hollywood doesn't portray quickly, exactly. uh, correctly, books don't portray quickly, and if you try to explain somebody, they gotta go blank, because there's nothing like that. And it's that. not like Victory, Victory at Sea, no. and it's not like John Wayne. No. It's scary, it's scary, scary stuff. And it's all, a lot of it's just luck. I mean. Oh, it's all luck. The guy you're talking to, all of a sudden, his head's blown off. And I'm not trying to be dramatic here, and but that that's really how it happened worked. to yeah. me. The guy oh, next to me, literally four foot away, I'm talking to him, and there's about six of us standing in a circle, and the bullet goes right through his forehead. And that's it. And, and you keep asking yourself, why wasn't that me? Why? It's all luck. It's yeah. all luck. It's all luck. I'm all convinced some way when they manufacture bullets, it has your name on it or it doesn't, because it is. Oh. The guy next to you can get hammered, you get nothing, planes go down. Uh, let me just ask you this, because we want to go into Walter Reed in about another minute or yeah, so. Yeah, good. But let me ask you this. Was it a, Army was there a year, 12 months. The same thing with the Marines? Uh, the Marines were there 13 months. Oh, we so you had, had an extra month. We were better than the Army. Well, you were. <laughs> and the problem was with a lot of officers would do six months in combat operations right. and then six months go back in a uh, Rear area, okay. You know, uh, safe area. Yeah, okay. More or less right, safe. Okay. So. Well, a year of combat is beyond my description. And keep in mind, now I broke my leg there, and I was sent to Guam, where they eventually operated, and I was sent back to the states. But it was, you go from that insanity oh. back to peacetime, which is pretty traumatic. It's an amazing adjustment. Amazing. Well, look, let's shift gears now. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we could talk Vietnam forever. And the people still wouldn't believe us. I mean, I, I think when I talk about Vietnam, my wife just looks at me and says, you're the biggest liar in the world. <laughs> Bob, another, besides the great things you did in Vietnam as a uh, member of the Marines, 
you got real involved with what was going on with Walter Reed. Now, explain to the public what was going on, how you got involved, et cetera, et cetera. When I got back from Vietnam, I was um, the uh, patient at St. Albans Naval Hospital in New okay. York, and I was at the Marine Barracks, Brooklyn. So in 2002, when we were talking about invading Iraq, and uh, we started with the plans to invade Iraq, I said to myself, this is going to last more than 90 days, and we're going to have some wounded. I'm going to sneak over to Bethesda Naval Hospital and go in the back door and talk to Marine Liaison, just to go up to say hello yeah, to the patients. Sure. We didn't have many visitors in Vietnam, and when you're wounded and you are just returned to the country, you need visitors. You're just, you're just in a bed. So I did this, and what became one or two visits a month became addictive. Okay. Uh, I started this in 2002, and almost 4,000 visits later, I've ended up creating a nonprofit called 100 Entrepreneurs, which essentially helps mentor veterans to become entrepreneurs. Okay. I would go over there. The main lesson I was taught and learned in visiting at Walter Reed and Bethesda both was you go in and listen. They don't want to hear what Ranko was. They don't want to hear any great thing I did. They don't want to hear any war stories. They, they want, want to talk, talk. Sure. about what they've been through. And we started with uh, essentially doing a program to teach vets about getting into the construction industry. And a good friend of mine from Turner Construction who supported this named Tom Patchy and his wife Amanda were participants and speakers. We would go in and we'd have pizza at lunch We'd invite a bunch of the wounded out of the MATSI, which was the amputee center, and they'd come in and they'd have lunch and we'd talk about business opportunities. We switched from construction to entrepreneurship. So you're giving these wounded returnees the something to do. That they could set their mind and focus on something right. Right. besides worrying about how they're going to get to the bathroom or how they're going to get a date. And now keep in mind, these young men and women, and there were women in these classes, were badly wounded. We even had quadruple amputees. Bob, let's stop for a second. And most of the people out there, and most Americans forget, we send these men and women off to war. Tragically, we lose some to death. But describe, I, I, I mean, I met the, the triple amputee you brought to yeah. our coffee thing. Yeah. Describe for the public, what is there? I mean, it's not like the war is over, mission accomplished. It doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't work that way. And, and they're injured. They're badly injured. Uh, you, you got traumatic brain injury, like a bullet in the brain. Your rehab is the rest of your oh, life. Yes. Uh, we've had quadruple amputees. We've yeah. had quadruple amputees, five of them. A couple, several so have both gotten... Both arms and both legs. Both legs, both arms. So it's just basically have the torso. double arm transplants. Mm. Now think of that, you get transplant, it all of a sudden they have arms somebody in a, yes. a, well, it takes a lot of yes. rehab. Yeah, yes. But they become immensely close to each other. Uh, when I would go visit them, I would have credibility because all I had to say was I was a Marine in Vietnam. They respected you. They didn't care about anything else. No. So we would get the vets together. Now keep in mind, these vets are mostly on high drugs. So... They would come into our little pizza sharing luncheon. Uh, they'd pass out at the table. Oh. They'd have They're their wife pain. with them. They're they'd have injuries. their kids with them. Yes. They'd have their therapy dog with them. But amazingly, we've had probably three or 4,000 vets attend the classes. We do videos. Uh, you can go to 100entrepreneurs.org and see the videos. I think we've got somewhere around eight or 900 10-minute videos of starting a business. We've actually uh, had, I think the number is 16 or 17,000 views of these really? videos. And <coughs> the most significant thing is we've had over 600 veterans and caregivers. And Caregivers is key in this. You always talk about the caregiver. The caregiver yes. is just as badly affected as the wounded guy. They've got to is. change the bandages. They've got to help them go and to the bathroom. They've got to do everything. Yes. And it's all of a sudden, you're doing this for the rest of your life. And we've had 
well over 600 store businesses. It's every kind of business you can imagine. That's a great, that's great. I counted it up once about a couple of months ago, and I think it was 255 different kinds of businesses. businesses. From guys making bird calls out of exotic woods to hunting and fishing trips. And this gives them a future. It gives them money. It gives them independence. It gives them money. It gives them independence. It gives them something to focus on, Fred. But more importantly, it gives them something to set their sight on when they get up in the morning, get out of bed. You got something to do. Not lay there feeling sorry right. for yourself. Right. What's astounding to me in having done this now, we've done the classes for 14, 15 years. I can only think of one vet that actually came to our classes that has been a suicide since. So you're saving lives and as well as giving them astounding. careers. Now, yeah. I don't have big reams of data or anything. Mm -hmm. But you're helping the vet or the caregiver focus on something that they're excited and passionate about and start to move all this trauma that they've been through and shift it into the box that it belongs in. It really works. Oh, I know. Well, I met some people you've worked yeah. with. You're, you're helping people now. We have a, a Native American who's yep. going to ask for your help yep. uh, next Monday. I mean. I'm sorry, you're saving lives. I mean, you're, you're going to be modest, but you, you say you give them a reason to get up every morning, but you're saving lives. Well, it's, and I never thought of this. So when no. I went in there, I figured I'd be good to go into a sea of vet laying in bed with his legs missing to give him somebody to talk to that would know and appreciate what he's saying, but it became so much more than that. Oh, yeah. So we created a nonprofit foundation, Turner Construction Company, under the leadership of Peter Davern, have been huge supporters of this. They've been supporting what we do Good. ever since we founded it. Um, we still do the Zoom classes. I got one scheduled in two weeks. We get probably 15 to 20 tuning into the Zoom class, but we publish the video on the website, a YouTube video, we get three, four, five hundred people mm -hmm. looking at it. So there's a lot of so veterans looking they, at this stuff. They're connecting with each other. Well, Bob, look at that. I'm gonna, I gotta stop you now. Yep. We're almost, I know, <laughs> look at You and I, well, let's send this invitation. First I got of all, 12 more hours. <laughs> oh, that's good. Thank you for your service in Vietnam Thank you. and the Marines. Thank you for what you're doing with wounded veterans. Yep. Now, we want everybody out there to know if you want more stories from Bob, <laughs> more stories from me, and more stories from other veterans, every Monday here in Queen Anne's County, all the veterans invited, male and female, Duncan does, and Bob will tell you. We have black, white, male, female. Now everything. we have Native Americans. We have everything. It's veterans talking to veterans. And, and we listening. Invite you up. And, and listening. That's, and Bob talks to you about listening to the wounded veterans. That's what we do Mondays. We have book clubs, whatever. And it's just a way of people like Bob saying, thank you for your service. We're here if you need help, and we want to help. Come Bob, join us. Right, Bob, thank you again. I'm Fred Great. McNeil. My time's up. Thank you for your time. We're going to see you next time. And I salute all the veterans. Come on and have a cup of coffee with us.